Hello, my friends. This is Mike Williams, and welcome to another Wednesday evening on the Sage of Quay Radio Hour, your home for free and critical thinking. Along with the radio show, I am also the purveyor of the blog, the Sage of Quay, where we free think the esoteric because truth is indeed stranger than fiction. And I want to thank everyone for listening to last week's debut radio show and the kind words of support I received afterwards. That support is greatly appreciated because without you, I wouldn't be here doing what I'm doing. So thank you from the very, very bottom of my heart. Now tonight, I have what I believe is a very interesting show, a show that will hopefully get the critical thinking flowing. And I'm going to be covering two topics. Both are very much related. First, I will dig into the history of the original 13th Amendment of the Constitution, which is nowhere to be found in the current Constitution. The original 13th Amendment was ratified in March of 1819. It was designed to combat subversion and corruption by people who are adhering to and influenced by foreign powers and to prevent these people from subverting the Congress of the United States and thus the Republic. And when we talk about people who are adhering to and influenced by foreign powers, think politicians, political parties, lobbyists, and of course, corporations. Then I will discuss how the current government is not the organic government representing the Republic, but a corporation masquerading as our government, owned by the international bankers, residing in the sovereign city-state of the District of Columbia, which is not part of the Republic of the United States, therefore making the entire government apparatus a foreign occupying force. And once we get our heads wrapped around that this is what's going on and that this is what we are dealing with, then you will really begin to understand why nothing works the way it's supposed to work in this country. Which leads me to this great quote from Chris Hedges. We now live in a nation where doctors destroy health, lawyers destroy justice, universities destroy knowledge, governments destroy freedom, the press destroys information, religion destroys morals, and our banks destroy the economy. And again, that was said by Chris Hedges. Now to kick things off, I'm going to play a brief clip of Jordan Maxwell explaining the difference between the United States of America versus the United States, the corporation. So let's take a listen. Well, there's a big difference between United States or United States of America. Doesn't mean the same thing at all. United States of America is one thing. United States is totally different than the United States of America. That's the point that most people don't know anything about. So when you use the term United States, you're not talking about the United States of America, the 50 collective 50 states in the federal union. United States is not the 50 states. United States is a totally different entity completely. United States of America was founded in 1776 as a constitutional republic, but that was done away with in 1871. We're no longer living in the United States of America. As of 1871, we are now living in something called the United States. United States is considered not a country. United States of America is a country. It's a confederation of states, which we call the federal enclave, the federal states. But United States by itself is a company, it's a corporation, incorporated in 1871. You're under corporate law, which means the first thing right off the bat is that you have to have, according to corporate law, a president of the corporation. You also have to have, according to the law, a vice president of the corporation, and you also have to have a secretary treasurer, at least those three things you have to have if you're going to have a corporation. So today we have a president, we have a vice president, we have a secretary treasurer of a corporation, a privately owned company, a corporation, and the corporation was incorporated in Delaware in 1871. Now, Jordan Maxwell refers to 1871 a couple of times in that short clip and what he's referring to is the act of 1871 and we will cover that in a little bit but before we do here's a second clip where judge napolitano from a few years back 
is interviewing former Congressman Alan West and Connie Mack. The backdrop is they're talking about the deficit and the budget woes that were front and center at that time. But what I want you to do is to listen very closely to what Alan West says at the very end of this clip, where he refers to the president as a CEO and the United States as a corporation. Congressman West, is it time for the government to be shut down if the White House and Congress can't agree in order to force the president's hand and compel him to do what we hired him to do, which is run the government within the confines of the Constitution and only with the money he collects from taxes and other fees? Well, you're absolutely right, Judge. You know, what we have to look at is the president is the chief executive officer of this corporation called the United States of America. Look, he uh, told the vice president that he would be part of this. Uh... Well, there you go, my friends, a very rare moment in time when a politician actually spoke the truth. Now, in this last clip I'm going to play for you, we have former PBS anchor Jim Lear interviewing former Fed chairman Alan Greenspan and asking Mr. Greenspan, what is the proper relationship between the Federal Reserve and the President of the United States? And listen very closely to what Mr. Greenspan has to say. What is the uh, proper relationship? What should be the proper relationship between a chairman of the Fed and a president of the United States? Well, first of all, the Federal Reserve is an independent agency. And that means basically that uh, there is no other agency of government which can overrule actions that we take. So long as that is in place and there is no evidence that the administration or the Congress or anybody else is uh, requesting that we do things other than what we think is the appropriate thing, then what the relationships are uh, don't frankly matter. And uh, I've had uh, very good relationships with Do presidents. That. So there you have it, right from the horse's mouth, from Alan Greenspan, telling Jim Lear that the Federal Reserve, the international bankers, rule the roost, that they are not going to be told what to do, and that the president and the Congress have no power and no authority over what the Federal Reserve does or the decisions that they make. So what did we get from the three clips I just played? Well, we had Jordan Maxwell explain the United States is a corporation as a result of the Act of 1871. We had former Congressman Alan West tell us the United States is a corporation and the president is the CEO. And we heard from former Fed Chief Alan Greenspan, who told us the Fed is a private bank and no one in government, including the president, can interfere or trump the Fed's decision making. And we need to keep in mind that the Fed controls the monetary system of the country, and as a central bank, the monetary system of most of the planet. So with this backdrop, what I'd like to do now is to discuss the original 13th Amendment, and then we'll segue into the Act of 1871, which established the corporate entity, which masquerades as our organic government. Now, if you read the 13th Amendment today, you will read as follows. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. So the current 13th Amendment formally abolished slavery in the United States, and the amendment was passed by Congress on January 31st, 1865, and ratified by the states later in the year on December 6th, 1865. So that's what you will see today if you read the Constitution and you head over to the 13th Amendment. And now let's discuss the original 13th Amendment. And before I get started, two sources that you might find helpful on the topic two websites that I would suggest you head over to, www.amendment-13.org and www.constitutionalconcepts.org forward slash 13th Amendment. These are two sites I use to help structure my discussion points on this topic this evening. 
The original 13th Amendment, which was ratified on March 10, 1819, reads as follows. If any citizen of the United States shall accept, claim, receive, or retain any title of nobility or honor, or shall, without the consent of Congress, accept, retain any present pension, office, or emolument of any kind whatsoever from any emperor, king, prince, or foreign power, such person shall cease to be a citizen of the United States and shall be incapable of holding any office of trust or profit under them or either of them. Now, in layman's terms, this amendment prohibited the use of bribes and graft by individuals and foreign powers, which are external to or outside the Congress of the United States with the implied intent of subverting the constitutional process, our political system, and the interests of we the people. Now, as an example, this amendment banned participation in government operations by attorneys and bankers who claim the title of nobility of Esquire. These people had joined the International Bar Association or the International Bankers Association, and they owe their allegiance to the King of England. And what do we have today throughout the Congress and government? Lawyers and bankers. And an entire system which is corrupt to its very core. And this is due to bribes and foreign influence. So for over 50 years, the original 13th Amendment was included in published documents. Many states, territories, and even the federal government printed copies of the Constitution containing this amendment. Now, you can find these documents on the web today, and I would suggest that you do a search on Echoes of the Cabinet, which is a book published by Dayton and Wentworth back in 1855. Now, this book contains the Constitution of the United States with the original 13th Amendment, the Declaration of Independence, and also the Fugitive Slave Bills of 1793 and 1850. So what we have here is a very early documented source with the original 13th Amendment included. So after appearing in numerous official publications until 1876, this article or this amendment mysteriously disappeared from our Constitution, and we can clearly see the results of this fraud all around us today. So the question remains, who was behind removing the amendment? Best I can tell from my research, we don't know. But guessing it was the international bankers or those that work for the international bankers is probably not too far off the mark. But subversive forces have always been with us. Since the beginning of time, they operate in the shadows. They operate with secrecy. We can even see that today. So even though we don't know who the culprits are, we do know that at one time the original 13th Amendment existed in the 1800s, and today it does not, having mysteriously vanished, undoubtedly due to corruption and deception. Another good question is, how did the public at the time not notice the amendment was removed? I can try answering that question by asking how many people today can articulate what the First Amendment protects the 4th, the 10th, and so on. In fact, how many people today would know or even care if the entire Constitution were eviscerated? So I'm going to guess the population back in the 1800s was as it is now, distracted and detached, and then factor in 200 years of elapsed time, and then perhaps it's no longer a mystery as to how the original 13th Amendment was lost and forgotten. But proves to me, at least, that subversive forces have been hard at work to dismantle our republic and our sovereignty since the inception of our country. To illustrate how much the subversion of our country's sovereignty has been diminished by foreign influence, I'm going to play this next clip from a couple of years ago. The setting is a Senate hearing with Senator Jeff Sessions quizzing then-Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta on what legal authority can the United States military go to war? Listen closely as Mr. Panetta clearly states 
that authority lies with NATO or the United Nations. And the only time the president has a say regarding war is if it is a matter of national defense, meaning only when the United States is attacked. Otherwise, the military takes its orders from NATO and the UN. Do you think that you can act without Congress uh, to and initiate a no-fly zone in Syria without congressional approval? You know, again, uh, our, our goal would be to, uh, to seek international permission, and uh, we, would, we would come to the Congress uh, and inform you uh, and determine uh, how best to approach this, uh, whether or not we would uh, want to get uh, permission from the Congress. Uh, I think those are issues we would have to discuss as we decide what to do here. Well, I'm almost breathless about that. The only legal authority that's required to deploy the United States military is uh, the Congress and the President and the law and the Constitution. Let, let me just for the record be clear again, Senator, so there's no misunderstanding. When it comes to the national defense of this country, the President of the United States has the authority under the Constitution to act to defend this country, and we will. Uh, if, it, if it comes to a, an operation where we're trying to build a coalition of nations to work together to go in and operate as we did in Libya or Bosnia, for that matter, Afghanistan, we want to do it with permissions either by NATO or by the international community. Well, I personally found that dialogue between Jeff Sessions and Leon Panetta to be a stunning revelation. We have the Secretary of Defense at that time explaining that the U.S. military is an international fighting force which takes its orders either from NATO or the U.N. and not the President or the Congress. I included this clip in order to provide an example of what the 13th Amendment was attempting to address. You cannot get, in my opinion, any more foreign influenced than the military taking its orders from NATO or the UN. The country, my friends, has been completely co-opted. Let's move now to the Act of 1871 and what it means and how it has completely corrupted the Constitution along with virtually every aspect of government and our lives. A source you may find helpful to further understand the Act of 1871 is the website Anti-Corruption Society, and that can be found at anticorruptionsociety.com. I utilize this site to help structure my discussion points on this topic this evening. Another great source is the article Who's Running America? And that article can be found at www.barefootsworld.net forward slash usfraud.html. Now, to get this segment started, a quote attributed to William Casey, former director of the CIA. We'll know our disinformation campaign is complete when absolutely everything people believe is false. Now, while most of us recognize that lobbyists for major corporations seem to control Washington, Few people know that Washington, D.C. is a corporation itself. The so-called federal government is actually the mother corporation of a vast network of state and local governments and governmental agencies that is actually a corporate franchise system. To understand what our government really is, we have to review the history that is not in most history books. February 21, 1871, Congress passed an act to provide a government for the District of Columbia, also known as the Act of 1871. The act was passed when the country was vulnerable and financially depleted in the aftermath of the Civil War. The act was a strategic move by international bankers who were intent upon gaining control of the Young Republic. So Congress cut a deal with the international bankers, specifically the Rothschilds of London, because the bankers were not about to lend money without serious stipulations. That deal was to incur debt. So the Act of 1871 put the wheels in motion for the gradual and total takeover of the United States of America by foreign banking interests. The Act of 1871 formed a corporation called the United States. This corporation is owned by foreign interests. Soon after the act was passed, the title of the organic constitution was corrupted by capitalizing the title, 
to reflect a corporate entity and the word for in the title was changed to of. The title of the organic constitution was entitled the Constitution for the United States of America, meaning the Constitution for the people. And it was changed to the Constitution of the United States of America, which is the constitution of a corporation, that being United States, Inc. So with the Act of 1871, the country was changed by stealth from a constitutional republic to a corporation. And now let's define a corporation from Black's Law Dictionary. A corporation is an entity having authority under law to act as a single person distinct from the shareholders who own it and having rights to issue stock and exist indefinitely. A corporation is a group or succession of persons established in accordance with legal rules into a legal or juristic person, meaning an artificial person, that has legal personality distinct from the natural persons who make it up, exists indefinitely apart from them, and has legal powers that its constitution gives it. And I'll say that again. A corporation has legal powers. Its constitution gives it. Therefore, the constitution of the United States is the constitution of the corporation known as United States Incorporated. And this goes a long way, my friends, toward explaining why the Constitution, as the people perceive and understand it, means absolutely nothing. Because the Constitution you are referring to does not exist. The Constitution that does exist is the corporate Constitution of the entity known as United States Incorporated. So now that we have the background, we can perhaps better understand why the following events occurred after the passing of the Act of 1871. United States Incorporated granted corporations the rights of persons in a slurry of lawsuits by corporations shortly after the end of the Civil War. The term persons is referring to an artificial person. Again, from Black's Law Dictionary, persons is an entity such as a corporation created by law and given certain legal rights and duties of a human being, being real or imaginary, who, for the purpose of legal reasoning, is treated more or less like a human being. Simply amazing. Corporations have been defined as humans. And now continuing on. United States Incorporated turned control of credit and currency over to the international bankers by passing the Federal Reserve Act in 1913 and initiated a taxation scheme on the people via the 16th Amendment. USA Inc. turned the U.S. Treasury Department, including all of its assets, over to the private Federal Reserve in 1920. This was done via the Independent Treasury Act of 1920. Okay, my friends, we are approaching the bottom of the hour, and with that, we will take a quick break. And when we return, we'll talk a bit about the bankruptcy of United States Incorporated and what that has meant to you and me. So stay right there. We will be right back. Welcome back, my friends, and I hope you are finding the show interesting. Again, I'm presenting information via my research to get the critical thinking juices going, and I highly recommend everyone do their own research to come to your own conclusions. And to kick off the second half, I'm going to discuss a little-known fact, that being the bankruptcy of the corporation known as the United States. In 1933, U.S. Inc. went bankrupt, and this set off another wave of deception and laws intended to eviscerate U.S. sovereignty. United States Incorporated, after being pillaged and bankrupted by the Federal Reserve Banking Cartel, turned over the entire country, including the people, as collateral on its corporate debt and bound the individual states to its bankruptcy obligations. United States Incorporated gave the CEO, the president, the authority to call a national emergency and establish executive branch agencies to manage the state of emergency. The national emergency has never been removed and is still in effect. Hence, we have far-reaching unconstitutional executive orders. United States Incorporated forced the American people to surrender their gold and use Federal Reserve debt notes as currency. United States Incorporated issued birth certificates and Social Security numbers, 
whereby making the people registered collateral for the payment of the debt owed to the banking cartel. United States Incorporated started requiring American people to get licenses to do business. United States Incorporated gradually altered the legal system and implemented corporate commercial admiralty law, better known as statutory law, throughout all the states, counties, and municipalities. Statutes are for their corporations and agencies. They only apply to us if we agree to contract with them. I'm going to take a moment here and read an excerpt of a speech given by former Congressman James Traficant. This speech can be found in the United States Congressional Record, dated March 17, 1993, volume 33, page H-1303. Mr. Traficant on the House floor. Mr. Speaker, we are here now in Chapter 11. Members of Congress are official trustees presiding over the greatest reorganization of any bankrupt entity in world history, the U.S. government. It is an established fact that the United States federal government has been dissolved by the Emergency Banking Act, March 9, 1933. The receivers of the United States bankruptcy are the international bankers via the United Nations, the World Bank, and the International Monetary Fund. All United States offices, officials, and departments are now operating within de facto status in name only under emergency war powers. With the constitutional Republican form of government now dissolved, the receivers of the bankruptcy have adopted a new form of government for the United States. This new form of government is known as a democracy. And there you have it, my friends. The government ruling over us is a corporation and not the organic government of the Republic of the United States. And if we go back to the Chris Hedges quote I kicked the show off with, maybe now we can see why nothing works the way it's supposed to work. To round out this segment of the show, I'm going to play another Jordan Maxwell clip where Mr. Maxwell describes some of the finer details of existence under corporate admiralty law. Jordan's website is The Jordan Maxwell Show and can be found at www.jordanmaxwellshow.com. His site is a plethora of information on our hidden history, and I highly recommend visiting and listening to his podcasts and his interviews. In this clip I'm about to play, Jordan comments on the creation of the United States Corporation in 1868. My presentation during this show focused on 1871. My interpretation of the chronology is the corporation was created in 1868 and then three years later codified with the Act of 1871, which gave that corporation, in effect, control of the fledgling U.S. government. So with that footnote, let's take a listen. Understanding words is what you really need to start doing. You need to start doing your homework and understanding words. If you put an S in front of words, it becomes swords. And that's what words are. They are cutting. They can cause you great trouble. Humans are word control creatures. So we need to establish what words mean. Again, when we talk about law, there's a Roman maximum in law that says for he that would be deceived, let him. Simply meaning, if you are so ignorant as to be deceived, then that's your business, that's your problem. So you need to do your homework and find out what the words mean, especially in relation to law and government. Because there is a whole a world of occultism that is operating today throughout the world in which you use certain words, and when those words are used in a court, they don't mean the same thing at all. Understanding law and the words of law, there are two things that this planet has. Water and earth, water and land. Consequently, there are two kinds of law, the law of the land and the law of water. You've heard the term law of the land. But in point of fact, that's precisely what this word means, law of the land, because it is the people who live on land. 
And that is opposed to something else called the law of the high seas or the law of water. You need to understand the difference. The law of the land is the law of the culture that lives on the land. And so consequently the law of the land is different in every country. You can do things in America you can't do in Russia. You can do things in Africa you can't do in England. So the law of the land is the law of the culture that lives on that particular land. However, there is a higher law that dominates the entire world. It's called the law of the water or the law of the high seas. The law of water is referred to as the law of money. It doesn't matter what color you are, where you're from, or where you live. Money is money. And any time you're doing banking or using money, you are now under the law of water, maritime admiralty. If you go back in history, in ancient history, where all of this began, back in the land of Cana, and I've heard, you probably have heard in the Bible, the land of Cana. The Canaanites were Phoenician, Phoenician bloodline. And in the ancient Phoenician language, Cana meant merchant banker. The very word merchant comes from mer, M-E-R, for the sea, for water. As a mermaid, we have merchant. Merchant bankers. Let me give an example of the difference between the law of water and the law of the land. The law of water, as I said, is a law of banking, money, as opposed to the law of the custom of the people or the law of the land. Um, the Statue of Liberty must be put in water. It could not be put on American land as such. It had to be put in the harbor because it's not the Statue of Freedom. It's a Statue of Liberty. Liberty is what a sailor gets when he pulls into port on a ship. He gets liberty. He's not free. So America is not the land of the free and the home of the brave. We're not free or brave, period. We're not free. This is not a free country. Now let me give you an example of how this law of the water works. Why is it that you have to go to court? People are always concerned about going to court. You go to court because you play basketball and tennis on a court. How do you play tennis on a court? You play with a racket. Why? Because that's what it is. It's a racket. And make no mistake, they do not pick words by chance. These words are very serious. They do not use words in terms... Um, with no avail. These words are very important. When you go into a court, what's the idea of going to court? It's a game, like basketball. The whole idea in a court is to put the ball back in the other guy's court. Uh, one team gets up and they throw the ball over to that team of lawyers. That team gets up and throws the ball back into their court. And consequently, it's a ball game. And the judge is wearing a black robe, so he is the referee. The judge is the referee. He doesn't care which side wins or loses because he's going to get paid anyway. So he couldn't care less. He's merely there as a referee, and that's why he wears a black robe. And that's another interesting subject we can get into later. But the judge is a, is a referee between two teams. The judge, said, we are told rules from the bench. The word bench in Latin is a bank. Therefore, the judge rules for the bank. Where do you find banks? You find banks on both sides of a river. They're called river banks. And what does a river bank do? It directs the flow of the current sea. <laughs> the juice. Consequently, your money is currency because it's the flow, the cash flow. And I'll give you an example of how this works. When a ship pulls into a harbor, all ships are referred to as female. Airships, rocket ships, sailing ships are always female. 
Why? There's a very good reason. Maritime Admiralty Banking Law says all ships are female because uh, they're carrying items, they're carrying items for money, and so consequently they are under Maritime Admiralty Law. Admiralty is where we get the word Admiral, Admiral of the Navy. <clears throat> Let me give you an example of how this works. When a ship pulls into harbor, it parks at the dock, and it ties off at the dock. The captain has to provide for the um, port authorities a certificate of manifest, because yesterday the ship was not here. But this morning the ship pulled in, so it has manifested. So consequently all the products, the $800 million worth of TVs or Toyotas, have manifested. So each one of those items coming off of that ship has come off of water. And each end they has come in a ship. And consequently on a ship, all ships have a captain. The word captain comes from a Latin word, capital, money. So the captain represents the money that's on board the ship. And as I said, the captain has to present to the port authorities a certificate of manifest for each and every item. How much does it weigh? What color is it? How many doors does it have? Etc. And consequently, the captain presents a certificate of manifest. The ship is sitting in its berth. Wherever a ship sits when it docks is called its berth. She sits in her berth, berthing a ship. Consequently, all the items, as I said, coming off that ship represent money. They came in on water. They are maritime admiralty product. And this is true all over the world. Now, when you were born, your mother's water broke. And when your mother's water broke, you came out. And this is why you have to have a birth certificate because you are a maritime admiralty product under international law you are considered, your body is considered a maritime admiralty product. Your mother delivered you. This is why if you go to Sears and buy a refrigerator, they will ship it to you. They will deliver it. And that's why you were in your delivery room. Your mother was delivering a product. Maritime admiralty. You came down your mother's birth canal. And once you, uh, and as you're taking one of the uh, the televisions or the cars off the ship and it falls down and breaks, uh, that's all right. Sometimes they're stillborn, so consequently you've lost money on that one. Therefore, you have to have a death certificate. And it's always signed by the dock. The dock has to sign your birth certificate and your death certificate. All of these words and terms are maritime admiralty banking words. And therefore, if you understand lawyers and judges and courts and government are all under international maritime admiralty law. All religions, all churches in the world operate under maritime law. This is why all churches are divided into denominations, like 20s and 50s and 100s. Serious. This is why they're called denominations, because all churches are nothing more than the product of maritime admiralty banking. It's an extraordinary story of occult uh, treason, high treason and crimes against the state. Make no mistake about it, there has never been a country on the face of the earth as far back into history as you can go. There has never existed a country in which the people rose up and demanded their right to be free. Never. The concept of human, spiritual, intellectual, and physical freedom is a totally a uh, concept that has never, ever existed on the earth. The only time that has ever come into existence was the founding of this country where it was understood that we were sovereigns and we owned our bodies and consequently since 1868 
we're now on the International Maritime Admiralty Law. Think about this, when cowboys and in Indian movies, when the cowboys would ride into town, they get off the horse, they were wearing guns. How come they could walk into a bar carrying guns? And if two guys got in an argument, they could go out on the street and draw on each other in front of the sheriff's office and the sheriff would do nothing. How come? How come that men could go out in the street and shoot each other in front of everyone and had nothing be done about it? The reason why is because before 1868, all Americans were considered sovereigns. And that's one of the nice things about being a sovereign, is you have the right to be yourself. And consequently, you need to understand that in, in 1868, there was a corporation founded. And in that particular company, the founders of that company called it, they referred to it as the United States Corporation. And they stipulated that anybody who would be a member of that corporation or work for that corporation would be called not an employee, but a citizen. So today, if you are asked, are you a citizen of the United States, what you think you're being asked is, are you lawfully in this country to do business? That's not lawfully what's being asked. They didn't ask you if you were in America lawfully. They asked you a specific question. Are you, of your own volition, out of your own mouth, testifying that you are a citizen of the United States? Because in that way, citizen of the United States means you are an employee of a foreign corporation operating on international maritime law. So today, the president of the United States is the president of a privately owned company. The company is called United States. And the word president is always a word that is used in corporate law. Banks have presidents. All companies have presidents. So there's a corporation called United States, privately owned, and it has a president. President Bush is not the president of America. President Bush is the president of a privately owned company. Privately owned, out of England. And you need to understand words and terms. Because I believe that there is a divine presence in the universe that men call God. And one day that divine presence is going to move on the earth and we're going to see freedom come back to this world. And when it does, you're going to need to understand words and terms and how they have been used to trick you. Again, the clip you just listened to was Jordan Maxwell. The intent of this show, my friends, was to present an alternative view to how you might believe the government or system works, or even your understanding of history. I will wager that almost all of what we discuss won't be found in any mainstream history book, like those in the public school system. For some, this information is not new, and for others, it is completely new. And it will take time to absorb and wrap your head around, because to think in terms of this level of conspiracy is not in the nature of most people. Most people think in terms of being honest and truthful. But as I mentioned in the last show, we are not dealing with people like you and me. We are dealing with psychopaths that have essentially no boundaries and think nothing of exploiting humanity for personal gain and control. I also wanted to illustrate how the agenda to conspire against the people of this country and the world for that matter, has been in place for a very long time and is extremely complex and, unfortunately, highly effective. The removal of this system of commerce, this system of slavery, will never happen unless we achieve a critical mass of people who understand they are being deceived to levels most cannot even begin to imagine. Understanding this deception starts with educating yourself about how the world really works at least the world that has been created for you by the controllers or puppet masters. It's important to understand that knowledge has been kept hidden from you. What you are told is knowledge is nothing more but a barrage of deception and lies disguised as truth. If the people of America do not come to grips with the deception, then this reality will continue to stay in place and thrive. This means people need to be critical thinkers and think for themselves. It's the only way to detach from the paralyzing trap of divisiveness and fear and then look behind the curtain at the great Oz and reclaim your dominion and your sovereignty. Well, that brings us to the end of this week's show. 
I hope you enjoyed the discussion, and I would like to thank everyone for listening. And thank you for your support and visiting the blog, The Sage of Quay, at sageofquay.com. Also, please check out my album, Leaving Dystopia, at laboroflovemusic.com. And remember, live in truth and always serve creation. It's really that simple. To close out the show, I will leave you with an excerpt from President John Kennedy's famous Secret Society speech. Until then, I'll see everyone next week. Be safe, enjoy, and God bless. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweighed the dangers which are cited to justify it. Even today, there is little value in opposing the threat of a closed society by imitating its arbitrary restrictions. Even today, there is little value in ensuring the survival of our nation if our traditions do not survive with it. And there is very grave danger that an announced need for increased security will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. That I do not intend to permit to the extent that it's in my control. And no official of my administration, whether his rank is high or low, civilian or military, should interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes, or to withhold from the press and the public the facts they deserve to know. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned. No rumor is printed. No secret is revealed. No president should fear public scrutiny of his program. For from that scrutiny comes understanding. And from that understanding comes support or opposition. And both are necessary. I am not asking your newspapers to support an administration, but I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people. For I have complete confidence. <laughs> in the response and dedication of our citizens, whenever they are fully informed, I not only could not stifle controversy among your readers, I welcome it. This administration intends to be candid about its errors. For as a wise man once said, an error doesn't become a mistake until you refuse to correct it. We intend to accept full responsibility for our errors, and we expect you to point them out when we miss them. Without debate, without criticism, no administration and no country can succeed, and no republic can survive. That is why the Athenian lawmaker Thor decreed a crime for any citizen to shrink from controversy. And that is why our press was protected by the First Amendment, the only business in America specifically protected by the Constitution, not primarily to amuse and entertain, not to emphasize the trivial and the sentimental, not to simply give the public what it wants, but to inform, to arouse, to reflect, to state our dangers and our opportunities, to indicate our crises and our choices, to lead, mold, educate, and sometimes even anger public opinion. 
This means greater coverage and analysis of international news, for it is no longer far away and foreign, but close at hand and local. It means greater attention to improved understanding of the news, as well as improved transmission. And it means, finally, that government at all levels must meet its obligation to provide you with the fullest possible information outside the narrowest limits of national security. And so it is to the printing press, to the recorder of man's deeds, the keeper of his conscience, the courier of his news, that we look for strength and assistance, confident that with your help, man will be what he was born to be, free and independent.